As you find a seat, we'll continue on with our worship this morning. Our sermon for this second Sunday of Easter is entitled, A Spirituality of Yes, Living in Resurrected Joy. Last week was Easter Sunday, and it seems like, I don't know if it seems like yesterday or a long time ago for all of you. Uh, The time outside on Saturday was wonderful with uh, the games and petting zoo and Easter egg hunt and all that stuff. But we're not done with Easter yet, so my question this morning is how can we welcome more of this resurrection joy into our lives? And I think it's easy. We just keep saying yes to it over and over. Yes, yes, yes. Christian faith is nothing more and nothing less than a lifelong attempt to utter a clear and simple yes to God and to other people in our lives. As we explore a spirituality of yes today, I want to introduce you to one of my favorite uh, theologians. Now, I know this is a Presbyterian church, and I promise at some point to talk about some bona fide Presbyterian theologians, just not today. Before I became your transitional pastor, I checked you out online, of course. I watched some of your worship services from the comfort of my home on my laptop, As I tuned into one of those services not long ago, I noticed that your preacher that day was a Catholic priest. Right then and there, I thought to myself, hallelujah, I can get away with talking about Karl Rahner. So that's who I want to introduce you to today. Rahner is a profoundly creative, richly imaginative, and intellectually stimulating Catholic priest, pastor, and theologian in the Jesuit tradition. He was born in 1904, died in 1984. I think, Alex, you have a picture of him. Took me a while to decide which picture to use. These German intellectuals uh, don't always have, sometimes they look a little dour, a little serious, but this was, this was the most joyful picture I could find, but he really is. He really is a wonderful chap. I completely understand if some of you are thinking, wait a minute, I thought this was a progressive, inclusive faith community. Haven't we had our fill of European white guy theology? Fair enough. And I'll admit, Rahner's stock was already losing value when I was introduced first to his theological work in the 90s, but I want you to know he's making a comeback. And the comeback's not being led by white guys, it's led at least in good part by some really amazing feminist theologians. Karen Kilby is the Bede Professor of Catholic Theology at the University of Durham in England. She's written extensively on Rahner, and you can find some of her interviews about Rahner, his life, and his work on YouTube, little nine or ten minute things, great introductions, Karen Kilby is her name. Now some of Rahner's writing is a bit uh, dense, not all of it, but some of it's technical. If you want to read something by Rahner, Professor Kilby suggests beginning with his book of Collected Prayers, which is entitled Encounters with Silence. I have a few more things to say about silence in a bit. Now in addition to Karen Kilby, Shannon Craig O'Snell, now teaching at Louisville Seminary. Now, Shannon happens to be Quaker, but she's teaching at a Presbyterian seminary, so that's as good as I could do today. Shannon has written a book exploring Rahner's picture of human life as a way of saying yes to God. Now, speaking of this task of saying yes to God, I want want to begin with one of Rahner's prayers uh, today. And Alex can put this on the screen. Why are you so silent? Why do you enjoin me to speak with you when you don't pay any attention to me? Isn't your silence a sure sign that you're not listening? Or do you really listen quite attentively? Do you perhaps listen my whole life long until I have told you everything, until I have spoken my entire self to you? Do you remain so silent precisely because you are waiting until I am really finished so that you can then speak your word to me, the word of eternity? Now I come with that prayer to our scripture reading for today from the Apostle Paul uh, writing to the Corinthians. This is from 2 Corinthians from chapter 1 verses 16 through 20. And you'll notice again the theme of yes. Yes. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and then come to you again on my way back from Macedonia, at which point I was hoping you would help me on my way to Judea. So I wasn't unreliable when I planned to do all this, was I? 
Or do I make decisions with a substandard human process so that I say yes, yes, and no, no at the same time? But as God is faithful, our message to you is, is not both yes and no. God's son, Jesus Christ, is the one who was preached among you by us through me, Silvanus, Silas sometimes, and Timothy. He wasn't yes and no. In him, it is always yes. All of God's promises have their yes in him. That's why we say amen through him to the glory of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, I don't always understand where Paul's coming from, but I like this. God's attitude towards the world is yes. God breathes the world into existence. God looks at it all and says yes. God looks at you and at me. God knows it all. God sees it all. And God moves towards us in a loving yes. God's spirit and God's wisdom are at work in the world to nudge all things towards their flourishing. And even when the world tries to shout a defiant and foolish no, God's larger and louder yes continues to carry the day. If the crucifixion of Jesus was an attempted no to the embodied love of God among us in Jesus Christ, then the resurrection, which we celebrated last week and continue to celebrate now, the resurrection was God's beautiful, agonizing yes big enough to hold even and enfold our hateful no. According to Paul, God's yes is a creative yes. It moves the world. It makes things happen. It calls for our response. By God's gracious energy in and among us, by that energy we name the Spirit, we too can say our own smaller but still powerful yes to God and to the world that God loves. That's why I wanted our young people, as they were up here today for the baptism, I wanted them to be able to imagine baptism as our joyful little Easter yes, responding to God's loving and larger yes to us. Now, in case you're thinking that all of this yesing is cute and all, but a little abstract, adorable, but a bit too general to, make, to be of much use in the concrete, difficult, complicated situations of our lives, let me bring us back quickly to what we read from Paul's letter. So what's going on in 2 Corinthians 1? Well, they got lots of issues. There's a leadership problem in Corinth. There's a lack of trust. Some of the people don't like the Apostle Paul. They'd rather replace him with some some of the other teachers. And so here's a group of people trying to work out their conflict, their tension, their differences under the larger framework of God's gracious, gracious yes to them. And to press this point about relationships, the Apostle Paul reminds the Corinthians that he planned to visit them so that they could help him on his way to Judea. Paul was traveling the Mediterranean trying to raise funds in support of the small house churches in Jerusalem. And he was hoping that the Corinthians would share in this offering so that God's yes to them would resonate loudly in their generous yes to the needs of their sisters and brothers in Jerusalem. If we want to live from resurrection joy, if we want to welcome into our lives what I'm calling a a spirituality of yes, then we begin by learning to live poetically and imaginatively in the theological framework of a God who speaks to us in Jesus Christ, saying only one thing, yes. Not yes and, not yes but, just yes. Yes. The bright and breathtaking mystery we nickname God says to all of creation, to all of reality, yes. And just to make sure that this divine yes doesn't float above us like some kind of abstract idea, the loving source of all reality draws near to us in Jesus from Nazareth. God draws near to us to speak this yes in spite of the fact that the world is addicted to patterns of hate and fear, And so, of course, we crucify the concrete yes of God's love when it appears. God's fiercely gentle love allows and even endures our no, but does not grant it any finality. God raises the crucified Jesus as the loudest possible yes to God's dream of a joyful community, even in a broken world. God resolutely refuses to allow the no of our sin to have the final word, And I don't know of any spiritual leader, theologian, who has more deeply grasped the beauty of this divine yes and the rich possibilities of our own corresponding yes 
than Karl Rahner. So let me talk a little bit about Rahner the theologian. He was one of the most influential Catholic theologians of the 20th century. He followed his older brother Hugh uh, by entering the Jesuit order following secondary school in Germany. As a Jesuit, Rahner was deeply influenced by the writings and the spirituality of Ignatius of Loyola. In his training as a theologian, Rahner found creative, new, fresh ways to read Thomas Aquinas, the medieval classic theologian. Now, Catholic theology at this point, in the early 20th century, wasn't supposed to be a creative endeavor, so Rahner's work often got him into trouble. He brought theological questions into conversation with modern thought, engaging deeply in the philosophy, in the philosophy of, of Immanuel Kant, and even attending le lectures by the existentialist philosopher Martin Heidegger in Germany. As a Jesuit theologian, Rahner taught and wrote prodigiously. You could start reading now, and you'd never make it through all the stuff he's written. His collected essays are titled Theological Investigations. That's what they are. There are 23 volumes of those theological investigations, so good luck on that. But it is wonderful reading. He addresses about every question or topic you can think of. Just as I thought through some of the ones that I remembered reading 10, 20 years ago, there were essays on kids, laughter, leisure, pets, aliens, all sorts of good stuff. Early in 1962, Rahner received word from his Jesuit superiors that he was being placed under an early stage of censorship, which meant in the Catholic Church that he was not allowed to publish or lecture without prior written permission from Rome. This was a blow to him. Later in that same year, 1962, Pope John XXIII appointed Rahner as an expert advisor to the Second Vatican Council, the ecumenical council of the Catholic Church that met from 1962 to 1965. John XXIII called for this council in order to update the church's teaching in order to better connect to 20th century people in a rapidly changing world. And the flexibility and the openness that was expressed by the Catholic Church at Vatican II in the early 60s was due, not exclusively, but in large part to Karl Rahner's influence. Let me say a little something more about a spirituality of yes. I want to say a little something about what saying yes to God looks like in our praying, our loving, and our dying. The Apostle Paul provides us with a fresh way to hear and respond to the good news. Jesus Christ is God's yes to you and me, God's yes to the whole world, and God's yes awakens in us the freedom to respond with our own yes back to God. But let's imagine together what this yes looks like from our side. Let me name three concrete ways our lives can take on the shape of this joyful yes, and in these uh, three practices, praying, loving, and dying, I'm adapting uh, here from Shannon Craig O'Snell's wonderful book on Rahner. So we speak our yes to God in our praying, in our loving, in our dying. I'll take them in that order. When we pray, we are saying yes to God. Our praying is perhaps the most basic way that we sing back God's yes. And when I say that we pray our yes, this includes our collective prayers, like when we say the Lord's Prayer together when we engage in the prayers of the people for those in need and for the troubled places in the world, when we pray as families and friend groups, thanking God for our food. It includes those times when we pray personally and devotionally in our own ways. This is true not just for nice, polite, pious prayers when life is going well, if that ever happens. I mean that all of our praying, including our angry praying, our praying while crying, our praying without hope, that, too, is our way of saying yes. Of course, sometimes we don't even know how to pray or what to pray. We get stuck. We get overwhelmed. And we go silent. As the Apostle Paul reminds us, there are groaning, longing prayers that are so deep within us that they're almost impossible for language to express. That's Romans 8, 26. And Rahner, too, is particularly eloquent in reminding us that our silence, even before God, is a kind of praying that resounds with a faithful yes. For Rahner, prayer can include silence. In fact, silence is required for any good conversation. If you don't know how to be quiet now and again, you're not a very good conversationalist. 
In silence, we're waiting, we're listening for the response of the other. And beyond that, prayer can include a more difficult kind of silence, what the Christian tradition calls the dark night of the soul. Mother Teresa, Teresa of Lisieux, speak of this dark night of the soul. Many people of faith, both in the tradition and even now, as our contemporaries describe large parts of life in which they are unable to experience God's love or God's goodness at all. Even this dark and difficult experience can be a rich silence. Even that can be a way of speaking our yes to God. Just one more little note about prayer before we move on. Paul points out that we end our prayers with yes. By ending our prayers with amen, this is our way of culminating the prayer with a let it be or let it become Lord. Yes, Lord. As Paul puts it, in Jesus Christ, it's always yes. All of God's promises have their yes in him. That's why we say amen through him to the glory of God. So for Paul, I think it's really interesting. By ending our prayers with a yes of our amen, we are offering to God not just the prayer, but our very lives. By reading the amen of our prayers as a profound yes to God, Paul suggests that in every simple prayer we're giving voice to a yes to God that's sort of like a miniature picture of our salvation. Our little prayers mirror the mystery of salvation that we pray and we sing our yes in response to God's prior and larger yes to us. So loving. I move on from praying to loving. When we love others, we are saying yes to God. It won't surprise you that loving God, ourselves, and others is the most elemental way that we express our yes to God. Jesus names love as the most important commandment. Paul says love is more important. It will outlast everything else. James, in his very practical letter, praises the life of loving care for those in need as really the only clear signal that we're loving God at all. Here, Rahner's theology is incredibly helpful. Rahner reminds us at every turn that God is always mystery. Here, mystery doesn't name a riddle you could solve or a problem you could figure out if you just had more time. Mystery means that God isn't the kind of thing one could ever grasp or comprehend. Again, God is mystery not because God is so high above us or so far away. Quite the opposite. God names a mystery too close, too intimate for us to see clearly. Put differently, God isn't an item in the universe. This is Rahner's analogy. If you made a list of all the things in reality that exist, you couldn't put God on that list as one of those items. God can't be compared to other realities like that. God is, as Rahner puts it, the horizon within which we see all other things, the atmosphere in which all of our experiencing and knowing and loving happens. So if God is the always close mystery That means that every bit of our ordinary experience counts as spirituality. When you are taking a shower, you are experiencing God. When you're walking your dog, you're experiencing God. When you're making love or cooking dinner or running errands, you are experiencing God. This isn't a God for the intermittently sacred moments of life. This is a God only available to us in the faces of our concrete neighbors and the way we extend ourselves to them in love. And we give voice to our own yes, not primarily by our professions of religious beliefs, but in the way that we love other people. So we say yes by praying and loving. Let me end with one more. We say yes to God in our dying. This is profoundly important for Rahner's theology. In our dying, our yes to God's love for us takes its final form. All our lives long, we've been working on a kind of rough draft. Through every period of life, every developmental phase, we've been trying to find the simplicity and clarity of our yes. In every experience, those times of life when we felt close to God, those times when God was nowhere to be found, in all of that, we were always editing the draft. We've been role-playing this conversational interchange, experimenting with this and that way of framing it, penciling in options, then erasing, starting over sometimes. But in our dying, says Rahner, the struggle of a lifetime to finally utter a clean and simple yes to the grace of God becomes the finished final draft. In death, we finally find our voice, and the only thing it says is yes. Now, why do we put it this way? seems sort of stark. For honor death as the end of life doesn't simply mark 
a termination point. Instead, our dying is a completion, a summation, a fullness of a life lived, a finalizing of the process of becoming who we are. Death is what makes our human freedom to say yes or no to God meaningful. That the lives God gives to us shuttle between birth and death means that, yes, we have time. It also means that there's not all the time in the world. Every single day of life we're given comes to us as a gift, as a possibility, as time for pruning away from our lives the unnecessary words, deleting the superfluous paragraphs, crystallizing what we want, that final finished draft to say. When I was in the eighth grade, I chose to write on the Pony Express for my history essay. It turns out that I'm not that interested in detailing previous iterations of our mail service, so it was a bad choice. Nevertheless, I did my best in this essay. And to be quite honest, I like how it turned out. I still have it, written in pencil, on paper. I assumed that the only real question would be whether I was awarded an A or an A+. So imagine my horror when I received my essay back covered in red pin marks and a large B. The teacher felt like there was too much fluff, that it needed another edit. In graduate school, I did my work in the religious studies department, but we had wide berth to take classes in any department we wanted, basically, and so I thrilled to the idea of reading the philosophy of Immanuel Kant with one of the world's leading Kant scholars. Class was held in one of the oldest buildings in the oldest part of campus, the philosophy department. There were maybe 20 of us in the class, and the professor wandered back and forth at the front of the wood-paneled room. His knowledge of Kant, of Enlightenment philosophy, was masterful. Now, because I wasn't one of his philosophy students, but instead an interloper from the religious studies department, I was particularly focused on doing good work and holding my own. He invited us to turn in a draft of our final papers uh, early, so I guess it wasn't a final draft, uh, an early draft, and the remarks I received on that early draft seemed promising to me, and so I went ahead and gave that paper my best effort, and the feedback I got on the final draft was, well, bittersweet. While I received a good grade, there was not a single positive statement within the long written response. The mistake I had made in this paper was so egregious so offensive, the world-renowned Kant scholar wrote that he would have much rather I had used the F-word repeatedly throughout the paper. And I'm saying F-word, he didn't say the F-word, he used the (laughs) F-word. Now, what, you may ask, was my offense? Well, I had, in one place in the paper, accidentally written about a quote from Kant instead of the precise word, which should have been a quotation. Friends, this is not, by the way, how God will grade the final draft of our lives. God is the patient teacher, always luring us deeper, higher, better, always eager to help us give voice to the only word that needs to be said. Our faith is a lifelong attempt to utter a clear and simple yes to God and others. We say this yes in our praying, in our loving, and in our dying And let me end once more with Ronner's prayer. Perhaps you can hear in it something fresh now. Why are you so silent? Why do you enjoin me to speak with you when you don't pay any attention to me? Isn't your silence a sure sign that you're not listening? Or, here's the turn. Or, do you really listen quite attentively Do you perhaps listen my whole life long until I've told you everything, until I've spoken my entire self to you? Do you remain so silent precisely because you are waiting until I am really finished so that you can then speak your word to me, the word of your eternity? Amen.